Well, it's so good to see you today. Uh, we're in this series called Too Busy Not to Pray. And we've been talking about famous prayers in the Bible. We talked about how to pray for success. We talked about Jesus' prayer for the church and how that we're to live together in unity. Last week, we talked about how do you pray when you come to church. And today, I want to talk to you about this subject, praying for our next step as a church. Praying for our next step. What is our next step? Well, we obviously have been talking about that as far as being able to find the land and the location, the building that God wants for us. And so that is something that all of us need to pray. Well, for those of you that may not know, um, we started this church September the 9th, 2001, two days before 9-11. And God used it in a mighty way. That first Sunday, we saw uh, a lot of people get saved, and some of whom are still with us to this day. And so God's used this church over the years, the way we started the church. Um, there were two things that I said I never wanted to do. I, I've learned never to tell God that I'll never do something. You, you ever said, I'm not ever going to do that, and then God just kind of laughs, and you do that anyway? Uh, well, when I first went in the ministry, um, there were two things I did not feel like I was equipped to do. One was be an evangelist and travel around uh, from church to church, and the other was start a church. Well, surprise, surprise, God had me do both of those things. Uh, I was in evangelism. I'd been a senior pastor. I'd been a youth pastor for a long time before that. And um, God called me into evangelism, and I know now why he did. He was preparing me to pastor this church and to start this church. And I'll never forget, we went on, I went on a 40-day fast. I don't know if you've ever done something like that before, but that has to be empowered by God. And uh, in fact, I was watching television, and I saw a very famous preacher, and he had lost weight. And I, I picked up my phone to call my friend. I said, I, you just won't believe what God is calling me to do. This pastor had been talking about a 40-day fast. And my friend said to me, he said, yes, I will, because God has called you and me both to go on a 40-day fast together just surprised me, but God began to work. Well, as a result of that, uh, God led us to start this church. And uh, I knew for sure that God had called us. Now, the problem with starting a church, if you don't have any members, and you don't have any money, and you don't have any facilities, you don't even have a chair for anybody to sit in, you got to have a lot of faith. And we gathered a few people together and we began to launch the idea of starting this church. And there are three things that we prayed that God would help us to do and to be. Number one was to reach the unreached. We didn't want to be a church where the first church I pastored is a wonderful church. But when I came, became the pastor there, we averaged probably about 200 uh, people there on Sunday morning. And, uh, but I remember the membership role. I looked at it and we had 3,362 members and about 200 of them would show up. Majority of these people, the FBI could not have found. All right. We had no idea where they were. We said, God, we don't want to be that kind of church. We want people to participate. And so we asked God to help us to reach the unreached. We asked God to help us break down barriers and this is a very important thing because so many people have a barrier up when it comes to their relationship with God. They see some, and I believe well-meaning Christians that are what I call rock throwers, and they're the ones that want to act as if they have no sin. They become a bit hypocritical. And people see that and it creates a barrier. We wanted to break down barriers. And the third thing we wanted to do we said, we want to look like heaven. In other words, we wanted to look like not the typical church in the South or in the North or wherever, but we wanted to look like our community. We wanted people of all colors and all creeds and, and all backgrounds to come to this church. Why? Because that's what heaven's going to be like. And it's going to be people from every uh, grouping that you can possibly think of. 
And God began to answer that prayer. Well, we struggled for a few years, and uh, I almost had a meltdown. Have you ever just took everything, have you ever just taken everything and held it in? It was all the burden on you, and you act like you were the one that had to get it done. Now, I believe in hard work, and I believe in determination, and I believe in planning, but do you know that it is up to God to give the increase? Some sow, some water, but God gives the increase, and it's that way in, in our jobs, and in our life, and it's that way in church. And one day, I was driving down the road, driving down 75, and I suddenly began to just weep uncontrollably. This was a couple years in. I had so much stress and so much pressure on me, and I just began to break down. And I'll never forget the words that I prayed as I sat. I had to pull over. I was weeping. I could not see. I pulled over on the side of I-75, and I said, God, you've got to take this. I can't do it. And you know, after that point, we began to grow. We grew, and man, God really blessed. We saw a lot of people saved, a lot of people come to the church. And then we hit some barriers. Uh, we had some struggles. Uh, we had a struggle with uh, uh, the IRS and some tax issues. We had struggle with some staff members that we had four churches started out of our church. One of them was on purpose. All right. Um, you, you, you should have laughed at that. I thought that was a pretty good joke. I worked on that. <laughs> Let me try that again. Okay. Y'all pretend like you actually like me. Okay. Um, we, st we had four churches started out of our church and at least one of them was on purpose. Thank you. That makes me feel so much better. Well, of course, we went through a pandemic and then we went through a move and here we are today. But just like that song says, God did not bring us this far to leave us here. God did not bring us this far to leave people in this community and around the world unreached with the good news of Jesus Christ because he wants to use you. He wants to use us collectively. He wants to do something that only he can do. But the question then is how do we do this? Well, prayer is important. Have you figured that out yet? Prayer is important. Prayer changes things. God answers prayer. When, when I don't pray and I work, I believe God rests. But when I pray and ask God to work and I rest in him, then he does what nobody else can do. And so that's what God wants to do. So today we're going to read from a passage in Luke chapter 18. And this is Jesus telling just this brief little story and in it, we're going to make some application. We're, we're going to make the obvious point of the story. But we're going to make some applications to where we are. How do we pray for God to help us take our next step? Luke chapter 18. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Then I'm going to go back and read it again from the message paraphrase. I think you'll find it interesting. It says, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. Hello, got my attention right there. You ever just trust in yourself instead of God? He told this parable, he said, some people trust in themselves and they trust that they are righteous. In other words, their own good works, their own good deeds. God, I'm a good person. God, I've invested in the church. God, I've been faithful in church. Why then did you let this happen to me? Why did I get fired? Why Am I sick? Why are my kids acting like they are? We oftentimes trust in our own goodness, don't we? We act as if God owes us something. Man, that's the wrong way to approach a relationship with God. He says they also treated others with contempt. Christians have a tendency to do that. The longer we're saved, the more we begin to look down at others that are not saved. We begin to do things that I don't believe Jesus ever intended for the church to do. We begin to throw rocks and we begin to boycott things. And you know what's funny to me is why any Christian would expect a non-Christian to act like a Christian because they're not a Christian. And our job is to spread the good news. 
It says two men went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. That was, if you don't know what that is, it was a religious leader of the day, very religious person, but they tended to be very self-righteous. They tended to be hypocritical. We could uh, use that to say there are some hypocrites. They acted like they didn't have any sin. They acted like they never did anything wrong. They wanted to judge everybody else's sin, but never look at their own. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now, I don't know about you, but tax collectors in this culture, nobody likes them. Anybody ever been audited? Raise your hand if you've been audited before. I've been audited, and I'll never forget dealing with this person, and um, that she tried to intimidate me. She tried to tell me that I was going to have all. Anyway, it's a long story. To be, to, to make a long story short, I left not being a fan of the IRS. All right, so I'll just say it that way. Yeah, some of you are the same way. Now think about it in our culture, but in that day, not only did they collect taxes, but these tax collectors worked for the Roman government. Remember, Rome was in control of Israel there, and the Israelites were uh, under their domination, and tax collectors worked for Rome. In other words, they were traitors, a lot of people felt like. Not only were they traitors, but they were also dishonest. And they would, whatever they charged, like if you owed, you know, $100 in taxes, they could charge you $200 and they would keep the other 100 and give the other uh, to the Roman government. So people despised them. So one, a very religious, respected person. The other, a tax collector. He said, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I want to read this same passage from the message paraphrase. I think it's it's very helpful to understand the text. He told this next story to some who were uh, complacently pleased with themselves. You ever get complacent? You ever get complacent on God? You ever get complacent in your relationship with God? You ever get complacent about going to church? You ever get complacent about serving? It's something that we all struggle with from time to time. The devil's going to try to get in your life and discourage you. You got complacent. But not only did he get complacent, he was pleased with himself over his own moral performance and he looked down his nose at common people. God forbid that a church ever be that way. The church is to be a hospital for the sick. It's not to be a country club for the insiders. He goes on and he says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. And the Pharisee posed and prayed like this. You ever just pose? We pose often at church, don't we? We go to get ready on Sunday morning. It seems like everything possible, especially if you've got kids, gets thrown in your way. Man, you don't feel like going. You get in an argument before you leave the house. You're about to... Uh, spank the kids and you know uh, if you have little ones you have to change outfits three times because they get messed up before they come to church and you argue in the car on the way to church you're at each other's throat and a giant halo descends out of heaven the moment your tires hit the parking lot and you walk in and the the guest services team they'll look at you they'll say good morning how are you and you're like great you're not great you want to kill somebody We pose, don't we? We pretend. 
God, Jesus said that's not the way to act. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this tax man. Isn't it interesting how we uh, stack up sins? Anybody that's a robber, a thief, man, that's, that's pretty bad. A crook, an adulterer, or even dealing with my money. This guy tries to take some of my money. That's the way we are, isn't it, a lot of times about our money? You know, you can be a criminal. You can get away with murder, but don't touch my money, right? Meanwhile, the tax man slumped in the shadows. Now, did that mean he was, had no confidence? No. It meant he was in humility, repenting understanding that he had to think like God did. He had to change his mind. He slumped in the shadows, his face and his hands, not daring to look up and said, God, give mercy. Forgive me, a sinner. And Jesus commented, this tax man and not the other went home, made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face But if you're content to be simply yourself, you become more than yourself. God wants to use you. God wants to make you more than what you are right now. God wants to expand your vision. God wants to expand your dreams. He wants to expand your influence. He has you here for a reason. And it's not just to fill some skin for a few years. It's not just to get a house or a vacation place, or a nice retirement. God has you here for a reason. God has you here not only to praise him, to to point people to Jesus Christ. Well, the obvious main point of the story is this. You can't be made right with God through your own righteousness. We're not good enough. The moment we think that we're good enough to go to heaven on our own, God laughs. The fact is, how can perfection, Jesus Christ, God the Father, the absolute personification of holiness, how can a person like you or me with a straight face say, well, yeah, I'm I'm a good, I'm a good person. You ever thought how silly that is? I mean, the truth is, it would be more ridiculous than if I said, you know what, I'm gonna apply to work at NASA. And I went down there and I met with people and they said, Mr. Miller, what are your qualifications? I said, look, I learned to make a mean paper airplane when I was a kid, those are my qualifications. Well, they would laugh me out of the room, all right? In the same way, how can I possibly try to tell God that I'm good enough? Oh, you're probably good compared to other people. We're not saying that. We're not saying that every person in the room or every person in the world is a murderer. We're just simply saying that the Bible teaches us, and we know this intrinsically, we know that we fall short. We're not perfect. We need help. And the point, the main point, was that self-righteousness is the path to destruction. But repentance and trusting in God is the way Uh, to success, and it's the way to eternal life. Now, I want to just make three points of application to apply it to our situation. Remember, we're asking God, give us a permanent home. Give us a place where we can use to reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Why do we pray that? It's about reaching people. It's not about us. To be honest, if all of this was simply about a building or building a, a, a monument to someone or building the Taj Mahal so we could go in and be real comfortable and smug. Man, I'm not interested in that. I don't want to be a part of that. But you know what I do want to be a part of? I want to be a part of a community. I want to be a part of a group of people that come together and trust God. God gives us a place that we just use it as a tool. A building's simply a tool. That's all it is. It's not a monument to me or to you or to anyone. It is something that is to be used for God. Now, the first point that I'm going to make of application is this. 
we've got to get into the position to pray. Now, I don't mean folding your hands or getting on your knees, but I want you to see the contrast between the two men and how this shows us that if we're going to pray in faith, we got to get in the right position. Uh, it was pride versus humility. Can't trust in ourselves. Got to trust God. It is self-righteousness and moral performance versus repentance. You know the word repentance means to change your mind. We got to think the way God thinks. Once again, if we're going to do that, we've got to think about reaching people, not just bricks and mortar. Uh, it was about trusting yourself versus trusting in God. It was about complacency versus faith. It was about contempt towards sinners versus admitting your own sin. You see, we should never be a place that is the rock-throwing community. Uh, it is Jesus condemning self-righteousness, self-effort, or not depending on God, self-centeredness and self-promotion for an agenda, a lack of love toward irreligious people, and um, a judgmental attitude. He was saying, don't pose, don't pretend. Jesus prays humility and repentance and love for people, love for the gospel, and asking God for what only he can do. You see, we must not pose or pretend, but we've got to position ourselves to pray. If God is going to use us and truly answer our prayers, we've got to position ourselves to pray. Now, you say, how do we do that? Well, you remember our mission statement, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. The key part being bringing people. The key part being wherever they are. Remember, we are a faith community, but we're also a grace community. We are a place that should be where people who need Jesus want to go. You know what's ironic? That most churches, that people who don't know Jesus, that's the last place on earth they want to go. Why? They feel like they're going to get judged. They feel like they're going to get condemned. But God forbid. Our mission is to bring people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just about reaching people, but it's about telling the truth and giving grace. Remember, Jesus said, uh, or, or John wrote in, in the Gospel of, of John, the first chapter, he said, the law came through Moses. Moses and the law, it condemned. It was something you could not live up to. But the Bible says, and I love this, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, you can't have one without the other. A church that doesn't build itself on the truth and just soft shells, it soft peddles the gospel or doesn't truly teach what the Bible teaches, well, you're not doing anybody any favors. You may make people feel good for a minute, but if you don't tell the truth, it doesn't help them. Why? The goal is to become more like Jesus. The goal is to be in a relationship with Jesus. But you got to do that with a whole lot of grace. You know why? Because we need a whole lot of grace. I've seen churches that had a lot of truth, but not much grace. And I've seen churches that had a lot of grace, but not much truth. Well, the Bible says that through Jesus came grace and truth. I want to remind you of our value statements. We're talking about getting in a position to pray and ask God to do something miraculous. One of our value statements is we embrace the mess. Did you know life is messy? Did you know that there is no perfect place? There is no perfect church. There are no perfect people. We've got to embrace the mess. And if we're going to be truly used by Jesus Christ, we've got to be willing to let the unwashed masses come in. You see, that's what God's called us to do. Uh, one of our statements is we're better together. You can't do Christianity alone. It's always odd to me, people that think that they don't need the church. That is a foreign concept to the Bible. That is a foreign concept to Jesus. Um, church is not just about hearing a message. If that was all it was, and it's not just about hearing worship music, if that's all there was, then yeah, you wouldn't need church. You could just listen to it on a podcast or the internet or the radio or whatever, and that'd be fine. 
But church is so much more than that. It's about coming together and encouraging one another. It's about using the gifts that God has give, given us. It's about participating to spread the good news of the gospel around the world. We are better together. Another statement is your next step is your most important step. What you do next, that's what matters. It doesn't matter what's in the past. We say generous people are happy people, and we believe that because Jesus said that. We say participation is membership. Now, what does that mean? Well, we don't want to be a church where a lot of members have a name written on a piece of paper, but they don't show up. Participation is membership. God has called you to participate. And I love this next one. Inviting is evangelism. I want us to throw that picture up on the screen. Um, about four weeks ago, a man named Gary, here I'm in his house with him this last week. Four weeks ago, he sat over in this section. And um, he had told his neighbor, he told Yogi and Greg, he said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. And thank God, I've talked to Yogi about this. Thank God they invited this man to come to church. They invited him. Remember, inviting is evangelism. And he had just found out that he had cancer just about four or five weeks ago. I mean, can you imagine just finding out that you've got cancer? And he came to church and he got saved sitting right over in this section. He prayed to receive Jesus Christ as his savior because somebody invited him. Well, last Sunday, he was planning to come, but he woke up and they had to rush him to the hospital. Well, to make a long story short, they ended up putting him in hospice care at home. And I talked with his wife and I, I talked with him and this last week, I went by his house. That's me at their house. And I prayed with him, and I baptized him. He wasn't even able to come to church and get in a baptistry, but we baptized him. And yesterday morning, about 5.30 in the morning, Gary went home to be with Jesus. I told Kim, I said, well, he's not going to be able to come to church this Sunday. He said, yeah, but he's going to be with Jesus. Now, why do we talk about this? Why do we say this? There's only one reason. Because Jesus wants to add people to his family. Thank God, Gary, today, he's not in pain any longer but he's in the presence of Jesus and will be forever, forever, forever. Now, you may not think that your participation in this is important, but I guarantee you it's important to somebody. What if the person that you're supposed to invite was Gary and you didn't? What, what would that be like? What if the person you invite comes, and maybe it's a single mother, and she comes and gets saved, and her son ends up being the next pastor of this church. You say, well, that doesn't happen. I guarantee you it does. Somebody had to invite Billy Graham to Sunday school, and that Sunday school teacher won him to Christ, and he became the most famous evangelist I guess the world has ever known. So you have no idea. You need to have your kids here. You need to have your youth here. You need to participate. Why? Because you just don't know how much you're impacting heaven. And that's what God has called us to do. Inviting is evangelism. And then one of my favorite sayings that we say about this place, this is the perfect place for imperfect people. Just take a minute and look around. I know I'm preaching, but pretend like you're listening. All right, look around. A lot of times I'll say stuff and people won't participate. I'm like, are they asleep? All right, look, look around. All right, look at the person next to you, behind you, in front of you, okay? 
You do not see a perfect person here. Now I realize some of the husbands think that they're perfect. Ladies, let me just tell you this. Men, for some unknown reason, have an ungodly amount of self-confidence with their body. I do not know why. I can guarantee you, it doesn't matter how big the belly is. It doesn't matter how uh, droopy the skin is. It doesn't matter how not neat he is or how skinny his legs are. Your man will strut his stuff and like, hey, I'm not sexy looking. And you're not, okay? And as you get older, you're not. And I believe that God lets us get this way as we get older because he says, you don't need to have kids at this age, right? Okay? But my point is this. Um, You and I, we're in a place that's the perfect place for imperfect people. We're not perfect. Therefore, we don't get to look down our nose at people who need Jesus. But what we must rather do is, because of the grace of God, welcome people with open arms so that they too can experience what this tax collector experienced. Well, I've got two more points, but I'm not going to preach them. But for those of you that would have a nervous breakdown if I didn't complete uh, the outline, okay, and you're looking at this stuff online, let me just say this. The second thing, application is this. We must ask God to do what only he can do. Only he can do. I had down to tell stories of God's provision in the past. God's done miracles for this church in the past. I flew to Texas a couple weeks ago. And a friend of mine that I used to do evangelism with, he and I uh, probably preached at least 25 times in different places across the nation together. He's a pastor of a church in, in Texas now. And they went into a building program three or four years ago, and they didn't know how they were going to pay for it. Good church, faithful people. And I I tell you this because he told me this story. There was a man, they were praying. There was a man that came on his property, and the guy's name is, the pastor's name is Clark. He, um, he thought the guy was trespassing. It was during the week. And he kind of was a little rude to him. Like, sir, what are you doing here? And he says, this is a church. And Clark, being a smart aleck, he's like, he pointed at the church building. He's like, uh, yeah. And the guy began to talk with the pastor, Clark. He said, what do you need? And Clark was like, well, we're trying to build a building and so on and so forth. And that man that he had never met before, (laughs) wrote him a check for $34 million. Now, I have tried to get that man to come to our church, all right? So, (laughs) here's what I know. God's got the resources. Now, maybe he's gonna use you. Here's what I know, all of us need to participate, okay? You know, we can wait around for some guy to give us a $34 million check, and trust me, I will receive it, okay? You said, what if it was a person that won the lottery and they gave you that? The devil had that money long enough, I'll take it and put it to good use, all right? (laughs) My point is this, we must ask God to do what only he can do, and then we got to change our thinking. That's the last thought. We can't think the same old way. We can't live in the past. We can't become complacent or satisfied. We cannot waste our opportunities. We cannot think small. And we must have faith. This is what God wants us to do. We've got to pray like life depends on it. Because it does. Because it does. Well, this passage teaches us that the gospel is necessary to be saved. Maybe today you would say, Pastor, I need Jesus. Online, maybe you would say, I have been moved by this passage of Scripture, and I know that I need Jesus. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. You don't have to join the church to be saved. 
You certainly don't live a good life to be saved. You certainly don't have to turn over a new leaf. It's repentance, which simply means to change your thinking. You can't think that you do it on your own, but you've got to receive Jesus by faith. You see, I trust in his finished work, not my works, but his. So today, in the room, if you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, or online, and you can mark that at the bottom of the screen, you can fill out a next step card today. Then I would ask you to say something like this to God. Dear Lord, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, and that he rose again. And I'm asking you to be my Savior. I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life and change me. Thank you. You see, the Bible says in Romans, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So today, if you want to call on the name of the Lord, do that. Receive Jesus. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. Maybe it is one of those situations where God just brought something to your mind. There's hardly a week that goes by that I don't have somebody come to me and say, Man, you spoke just to me. Or how did you know? Did you read my email this week? How did you know that I was going through this? And I don't know that. Um, But what I do know is the Holy Spirit will apply the Word of God to your life. And if you'll be open to it, He'll speak to you. So what is God speaking to you about? Maybe there's something you need to do. Maybe there's something you need to stop doing. So whatever it is, turn it over to Him. Um... You can pray with our prayer team after the service is over. We have a prayer team over here. We have communion available for anybody that would like it. We have a team of people that will pray for you no matter what it is. You don't have to be a member of the church to pray, uh, but you can go see them afterwards. But today, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to transition. We're going to transition to, I'm going to do a little update for you. It won't be too long. I'm going to do an update for you about uh, where we are and uh, where we're going next. And I want to bring a challenge to you. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for um, how much you love us. Thank you that you give us your grace. And Lord, we come to you today and commit ourselves to you afresh and anew. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and come and pass out to every person one of these doing our part booklets, okay? And uh, they're going to give that to you. And I'm going to just kind of give you a little bit of an update. I'm going to talk about some of the things that are in this booklet, and you can look through it. Um, and there on the very back, uh, uh, the very back page, there's a commitment card, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But we began doing our part in May of 2021, so it's been two years now. And uh, we had the vision, of course, of where God was gonna take us, and we had a location and a building, and uh, we know that God shut that down. Now, some people got discouraged over that, but I think that we've gotta look at it this way. That was an answer to prayer. If God did not want us there, he shut that door. That's what we prayed, okay? So let me just update you on our goals. We had a faith goal of 600,000, a great faith goal of 750,000, and a victory goal of 900,000. Now, what we had pledged during that time was $478,822.68. Okay, that's what was pledged. And then the amount given to date, you can see that $278,424.13. So, the amount needed to reach that first goal, which we do need to reach that first goal, uh, is $121,177.32. And that's over the next 12 months. That's doable. Uh, we should be able to reach that, no problem, if everyone will participate. You say, well, what should I give, Pastor? Well, I can't tell you what to give, but God will move on your heart if you'll pray and you'll be open. Now, I'll say this. If the amount that God reveals to you after you pray does not challenge your faith, that's probably not from God, okay? We, we use the phrase equal sacrifice, not equal giving, okay? 
And let me just tell you, Kim and I would never ask you to make a commitment that we're not willing to make. And we made um, a very, very large commitment for us, very, very large commitment. And God allowed us to sell our house, and we took some of the money from that, and we gave to this. And then we made a commitment uh, over a three-year period. Well, uh, I checked, and of what we committed, we have $152 left to give. That's it. And that'll reach that, that commitment. Now, here's what I'm saying. God's blessed us, and God blesses faith, and God has just given us favor. He will do the same for you. What we are going to do, and Kim and I have talked about this, uh, we're going to recommit. Now, what we're committing to is we're going to continue to give what we had given every paycheck. We give twice a month, and we're going to continue to do that over the life of this campaign. And uh, we're going to up our giving, in other words, okay? And so maybe today... Um, you want to make a one-time commitment. We made a very large gift at the very beginning of this campaign because God gave it to us. Maybe you want to do that today. We'll have the ushers come uh, at the end and uh, take the commitment cards, or if you want to give in that, you can. Um, It's a one-time commitment, and it's a one-year commitment, okay? So over the next year, Maybe you would pray, and you can look at these things, but you pray about what God has you to give. So if, there there are three things. One, maybe you made a commitment like Kim and I did, and you're already about to fulfill that commitment. Well, we're going to just up ours. We're going to continue for the next 12 months. Or maybe you made a commitment. We have a lot of people in this category. You made a commitment, and you stopped. For whatever reason, okay, we're not here to judge or to make you feel uncomfortable. But what I want you to do is to realize you did not make a commitment to me. You did not make a commitment to a particular building that we're not pursuing now. You made a commitment to the cause. The cause never stops. You made a commitment so that we could reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you made a commitment... And you, maybe you stopped, maybe a lot of things may have happened. I want to challenge you to start again, all right? Just start again, Um, and I believe God will bless you. The other uh, group we're going to ask to make a commitment, maybe you didn't, maybe you weren't here when we did this a couple years ago, and you'd like to make a commitment today. And once again, this is not a three-year commitment, this is a one-year commitment, Now, on the back of your brochure, there's a uh, doing my part commitment card. You can tear that out. It's perforated a little bit, but mine, I just kind of tore it. It's okay. All right. Anybody else ADD and stuff like that bothers you? You got to fold that back. So it's like, otherwise it's like, "Ah, I can't handle that. Well, you can use this card. What Kim and I are going to do, we've already talked about this. We're going to take the card and we're going to put the new commitment on it. Or maybe today you would say, you know what? I'd stopped giving, but I'm going to start back. What I'd like for you to do is to take your card, put your name on it, and just write restart. That's all you got to do is write restart. And whatever the commitment was, uh, you restart from where that was, Okay. Or maybe today, you're going to be one that says, Pastor, I want to get involved. I want to be a part of this. I want us to have a permanent home where we can reach a lot of people. And I didn't fill this out before. Then maybe you would like to do that today. Okay? Uh, And it's very simple. You can look at that chart uh, that's in the book or on the screen. And there's um, an annual amount that if you committed, for example, $40 a week, that equals $2,080 given. Uh, So anyway, you just figure out the amount. Maybe you say, I'm going to commit $1,000. Well, figure that out and and make that. You can do a one-time gift today or you can make it over the next 12 months. Or maybe you'd like to say, I'd like to commit $100,000. You say, well, pastor, have we ever had anybody give $100,000 before? Yes, we have. We've had several people give 
100,000, 200,000. One person gave almost a million dollars one time. And what I figured out from that, two things. One, God is faithful. And number two, a lot of you got a lot more money than you let on. All right, so I heard about one preacher that he, they were in a building campaign. And he stood up in front of his church. He said, folks, I got some good news and some bad news. He said, the good news is we got all the money we need to build this building. Everybody cheered. They're standing up, clapping. And he said, sit down, sit down. He said, the bad news is it's still in your bank account. All right, so maybe that's where you are. But I want to encourage you to make this commitment because when you do, I believe that you're going to impact eternity and that uh, you're going to make a difference. Now, uh, I'm going to give you just a minute and then I'm going to call the ushers forward. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these cards. If you want to fold it so it's private, that's fine. Okay. Or if you want to give specifically to this building fund, we're going to give you an opportunity. We're going to pass, when we pass those buckets again, you can put in your commitment card or you can put in an offering. Maybe you're one of the three people in the state of Georgia that still carries around a checkbook. Uh, you just happen to be here today. Well, uh, you can write a check. Or most likely, the better way is text to give. If you're already set up on that, it's real easy. Or you can give on the, um, the church app, okay? But what you do is you text DOP. And if you're texting, it's 84321. If you give on the church app, just make sure it goes to DOP, doing our part. Um, or if you write a check, then anything taken in in this when it's passed goes directly into that. Or if you want to give cash, you could do that as well. Uh, but here's what I want to do. We're going to take a minute to pray. And maybe you want to say, I'm going to make a commitment. Well, I want to challenge you to do that uh, today. And I believe that God will bless you for it. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to have faith, that you give us the faith to be able to obey you, and that you would bless us and help us not just reach goals. The goals are to reach people, but help us to have a permanent home that we can use for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to give you a second to make a commitment. While we're doing that, I want to show you something. Okay? Some of you have been like, well, you know, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's happening. And I get that. This first slide you're going to look at, it is a picture of the project that's being worked on. This is a 900 plus acre project. Okay? And we have met the developer. He is a good Christian. And uh, he has carved out a piece of property that we're going to get, we're going to acquire by faith. We believe this is going to happen. And uh, you'll see that he has already presented, this has gone to the city of Hampton. They've already annexed this part into the city of Hampton. Right now, it is at the Atlanta Regional Commission um, to be approved. And once that gets approved, you'll see this section of land, the little blue section there, is where Stillwater's Church is going to have a permanent home. Okay? So it's located right off of 20, and it's near uh, Hampton Locust Grove Road and 20. Okay? It's not actually on 20, but it's just, you know, right back off of it, as you can see. And uh, so it's exciting. Now you say, well, Pastor, I'd like to go look at that. Feel free to. If you go, here's the only thing I ask you to do. Stand on that land and pray in faith, all right? Believe God that he's going to do something for us, okay? And so maybe you'd like to, to do that. But those pictures there, we wanted you to be able to see that uh, God's doing something. God's at work. We're moving. We're headed somewhere. And we've got to do our part to be a part of this. So, well, we've given you some time. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward the last time. We're working the ushers out today. They, they got their steps in for the day. Drop in your commitment card, your offering uh, at this time, if you'd like to do that as we pass that. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have, um, we're going to have our um, people 
rally, tally this up and everything. We'll see where we are, okay? All right, we're going to let them pass that. If you need more time or you want to drop it in the drop box on the way out, it's to my right, to your left, uh, next to the next step sign. You can drop it in there. And in fact, you can drop anything. You can drop your next step card. If you're new and you've never filled out a next step card, fill that card out and drop it on the way out. And we promise not to sell your information. We promise we're not going to bombard you, but I would like to call you and get to know you a little bit. And so we're not going to stop by your house, but I just want to, I just want to speak to you, okay? And so if you'd like to do that, then uh, make sure you fill that out. Whatever your next step is. Next week, we're having baptism on Mother's Day. What a great day to have baptism. Um, you can come to the next step class. Last one we had, we had several people join. And uh, you can come to that next step class, which is going to be uh, just a couple Sundays from now. You can go during the service, and you can be a part of that as well. Okay? All right, I believe we've had time for our ushers to collect everything. Man, I love you guys. I'm so glad that you're here today. You guys are awesome. Let's everyone stand. What we're going to do today is we're going to end the service on a big note. we got a great God, and we believe for big things. And so today, we're going to end the service on this song. You join us now. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.